Welcome everyone to Almost Cancelled. I am Peter, that is Tara, and we are going to talk about Star Trek Strange New World Season 1 Episode 2. It's called Children of the Comet. So full spoilers for the episode, as always, and we're going to get into this. We we were left feeling positive, uh, optimistic, full of potential, perhaps, you might say, after the premiere, after the first episode was was, was quite good. Mm -hmm. And we, we came into this hoping that it wasn't just a one-hit wonder and that this was going to be a, an actual omen, a good omen for the show. So how do you feel, uh, you know, without getting too specific, we'll get into all the details, obviously, but uh, how do you feel after episode two? I still feel positive. I think it was a pretty good episode. I mean, it was very much, it was kind of just season four of Discovery all smooshed together <laughs> into an hour. We can, we can make some talking points on that comparison if you like but um. um i i will say um there's some things about pike from season two of discovery oh, that show up go. here that i was like i don't uh, i don't know man like he's still just captain stepdad having <laughs> it just came right out in this episode he's like look at me i'm handsome i'm quipping come on let's try to find some middle ground here <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Uh, there's also like, <sighs> you really don't see it at all. Like it doesn't. How 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 is it that you b defend all the crap new Star Trek like with this devout belief, like you're Tim talking about a Leprechaun movie, and yeah, those movies are good. And then <laughs> and then we get to <laughs> this, which is definitely easily the best new Trek of this like era of Trek. <laughs> And you're yeah, finding I, something well, to complain I, I about. I really like this this track. I don't know <laughs> okay. if it's the best because the animated ones have been pretty great. Okay, well, I'm, but, not, I'm, I'm not counting those. I haven't seen those, but yes. But yeah, I don't know if I like Ants and Mount. <laughs> I don't. Here's what, here's what he reminds me of. He reminds hmm. me of Scott Bakula as Captain Archer, who was very much the captain who was trying to be everybody's friend rather than this like you know, boss, which is what we get from Kirk, even though he is sociable and pretty flirty, he's still like when he needs to be commanding, like he demands respect and people just give it to him. And like you as an audience member, are like, yeah, that's the captain. Um, and, and obviously Picard who has like no social relationships with anybody on board, but everybody loves him. And he's so, he's such a great captain. And like, he's like, all you do is respect him. Like, uh, where Pike is just like, I'm your best friend. I'm going to make some ribs for you. Come on over, cadet. Oh, hazing. <laughs> I'm just not into it. I'm not into it. I, I like the episode. I don't think I liked it as much as the first episode, but that's not a, a big problem. That's not a big deal. Uh, what, what I liked about this episode in a broad sense, before we get into specifics about what it did right, you know, blah, 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 is that it still felt like Star Trek. It still felt mm -hmm. like... There was a, a problem that needed to be dealt with. Uh, I, I especially was... I was. I, I think, obviously, I was noticing it in the first episode, but I was really paying attention this episode to the direction, the camera work, and just how, like, not flashy it's being and how refreshing that feels because Picard and Discovery are determined to have all these quick cuts and Dutch angles and constant sweeping motion. And there's just moments where... It's just, you know, Pikes, he's standing talking to the alien on the screen, you know, who's on the other ship, and it feels like a Star Trek show. I feel like I'm watching a Star Trek show uh, yeah. in all the right ways. It feels like a bit of a... It feels like a mix of the original series and Next Gen. It's like, it's like a concoction between the two, obviously with modern tech and modern, like, effects and all that stuff, but in the sense that the plots feel a bit more original series -y, I'd say. Um... Yeah, I mean, we've only had two, so well, it's hard yeah, to really two. compare. But, like, I feel a bit more original seriously, uh, and the characters, I think, veer towards original seriously. But the fact that we have more character dynamics and personality and stuff running throughout the episodes, and the important thing, which is what this episode does, is that this episode is, by and large, an Ahura episode. This, in episode two, no, no, no time wasted in starting to give characters some focus for an episode and this is something that original series didn't really do beyond the main few but next gen did do it yeah Wh whatever character the cold open is about is what the episode's about by and large all of the main cast of next gen 
would get episodes that focused on them. And that didn't happen with Scotty. It didn't happen with Ahura. It didn't happen with other original cast members, right? You, you got... Okay, and even to an extent, Bones, who was definitely the third part of the trio, I would argue he was very heavily featured in most plots because of his role, but he never... It was never necessarily about his story. Like, he was never the, the driving force of it. No, so, not really. I mean, there are a couple episodes about him, but... No, not really. I mean, even like City on the Edge of Forever is he's the catalyst for everything, but it still ends up being a, a Kirk episode. The fact that this is doing that, that's, that's what I'm saying it's taking from Next Gen is that kind of thing. Um, and right away, this is like, no, we're starting with Ahura. We're focused on how she feels about this, just, you know, get together that they're having. And the captain has like the, the senior crew and like the new cadet for, for dinner. And it's just her talking about that. And immediately in the first few minutes, I'm like, you know, I was joking that in episode one that they'd already like made me care and made me understand who a lot of the characters were better than Discovery has in four seasons. This episode, like, sh- you know, I was like, okay, now you're you're giving Ahura an actual arc in an episode and letting us get to know this character along with the other characters. It's building a character. It's building a character that we can all get to know, and it doesn't even matter necessarily if like she perfectly matches up with the original series or whatever that's not the important point i'm even making right now let's forget this connects to the original series let's forget some of these characters are characters we know from other things and that it's part of a shared thing i'm just talking brass tacks it's a tv show with an ensemble cast that we're being introduced to it's doing the work it's spending time building the characters and it already sounds because you were saying next episode's got a, a character who sounds like we're, it says that we're going to learn more about lahan next episode and that's cool um so right away yeah, i uh, haven't seen it i was just looking at the imdb well of course you haven't seen it why would you have seen well, it? well i mean there are people who review star trek who have seen like the first like five or six episodes or something <laughs> I, I don't think anyone was assuming you had the screeners <laughs> well they might think that i have connections yeah, so we're already focusing episodes on individual characters and giving them the spotlight. And the fact that we're doing that in episode two, and that as we're doing the plot of the week stories, we can do this for each character. Like, and hell, that opening scene, probably the character that we sort of noticed the most last episode, but didn't get, it probably got the least amount of in terms of actually getting to know them, was Ortigas. And the opening scene of this episode, it was Uhura, who's going to be the focus of the episode, bouncing off Ortigas. And we got a lot of Ortega's personality in this, this, I mean, this episode as a whole, because she has a few ice cracks, but in this particular scene, mm-hmm. we get a lot of her personality. We get her playing this little prank on Uhura, because she's told that to come wear informal wear, and then it's like, nah, we're all just wearing casual clothes. This is just kind of a typical thing. It's a hazing. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something... A, a Navy thing, because, like, that's my certificate of being hazed for a whole day. <laughs> Wait, you got a certificate for that? Yeah. Okay. There's like a day for it. I can't tell you anymore. It's top secret. Pike understands this. Pike knows like this is a thing and just kind of like ch- chuckles when he sees her. But, you know, we, we get this idea that she is this young cadet. She's nervous about going to this, this dinner. She's nervous about being asked questions. She's nervous about these things. The amount of character that we're getting and learning about, because... And it should be this easy. When you think about it, how many movies do you watch that are only two hours long and it makes you get to know a handful of characters in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. Tons of them do. There's no reason why it shouldn't be able to do that in a couple of episodes for a character. So this is a weird thing because I'm almost like giving it this shower of praise for just not being bad and just not making the same stupid mistakes that some other TV does. So it's kind of a weird thing to be sitting praising but it's so refreshing because Discovery in particular in this case for this, this specific problem has done such a poor job of this <laughs> that this is, it just it stands out so much compared to it, standing next to it. Star Trek Discovery was a great show. It's gone a little downhill, but it was a great show. I think that, uh, yeah, I think this episode's really good. I enjoyed the cold open, which is really... A lot. It was a long scene before like the credits popped up. I was actually quite surprised, even though it's happened before in Discovery and, and Picard. Even, um, I liked uh, Ortigas as what we've learned about her and her personality. I like that she had a moment to shine later on in the episode too. She kind of felt like the secondary main character of this, 
just because she had she has like maybe 15 to 20 percent of the plot whereas you know obviously her as the main focus for the rest and uh i just like the i like the little details like i know you don't want to compare everything to the original series for this because it's its own thing really but like even the fact that like her character sings her character notices when spock is being flirted with you know and there's that whole thing with the kelvin timeline but it kind of stems from an episode of the original series one of the first ones where like oh her is singing and spock is like playing some sort of lute and you know they seem to have some sort of flirty thing going on in that and i i, I don't know if there's gonna be a relationship here especially since the first episode we see spock get engaged so but yeah no the singing things uh was, was a neat callback uh to, to the original series it felt like a way to sort of bring in part of that because i remember her singing with spock playing the uh the instrument uh, from the original series so I really don't she... know too much about Ohara except that she likes to sing and she likes to dance with fans. And I did notice she had fan earrings in this. So uh, I thought that go. was maybe a, a little cheeky callback. Uh, you can have a cheeky... Uh, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with a cheeky little callback like that. I, especially if it doesn't draw your attention away from anything because I never noticed them. So therefore it wasn't distracting. <laughs> uh, but like, I, I, think, I think pulling on something like that is neat because... You're taking a character that was effectively underdeveloped because Ahura didn't have much of a character before, um, beyond maybe a little bit of a personality. So, actually taking that and adding, you know, get putting some backstory into it and you know establishing that she's a character who just randomly sings a little bit, and it's not a thing she's doing for show, but you can sort of like in your head sort of think about, oh well, she's going to keep singing around people, and people get used to her singing, so maybe people will eventually start asking her to sing, so then you can imagine the scenario that happens in the original series where it becomes a regular thing where they ask her to sing at a gathering or something like that. So you can kind of see the, the knock-on effect. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I, I'm not sure how much of this backstory, when she starts talking about her tragic backstory with her parents and her brother dying, I'm not sure how much of that's new or if that's something that's taken from Trek lore, but... If it is completely new, I do think that none of it alters anything about who who it is because it just That's gives what it more you depth. Have when you have an underdeveloped character, yeah, <laughs> you, you yeah. free reign to do things like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's been in the books or something, uh, something expanded. But I, oh, sure. I'm not aware of this backstory. Yeah, because you know it was this thing where I, I think her having this choice that kind of comes up here where. When Pike asks her about her future and about being a Starfleet and how she's, you know, top of the class and she speaks, uh, like he says, like 12 languages and she's like, actually something like 37. Uh, but part of that's because her, like, homeland has like 22 native languages. So that's like a big chunk of them. I mean, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It's still very impressive. <laughs> like, it's still a lot mm -hmm. of extra languages to learn. I'm not trying to downplay that. Yeah. But, but this idea that, okay, so we're establishing her saying, we're establishing that. It's not just that she can push, you know, send, mute, and receive on a communication system. She actually is in a, a really intellectual person in the art of communication. That's her whole thing is linguistics. She's our Amy Adams, if you will, <laughs> from Arrival of is, the show. In, it's incredibly impressive when universal translators already exist that somebody would be so into language, you know? like um, It's like having someone who's just a professional navigator. When we, everybody like has GPS, <laughs> like why I don't know how to get home from like the mall down the street without my GPS because I'm so reliant. I mean, I used to know like the whole map of Southern California when I was younger, but since GPS came out, like I haven't had to learn anything. Sure. So I'm saying that, yes, it's extra impressive when you live in an age of technology where so it does the work for you that you still would take the time to learn. 22 different languages well, to speak to on that point though they, they, they do two things here to kind of like sort of kind of give you an explanation for that one is she says that the best way to get to know someone or sort of get a sense of them is to speak to them in their native tongue so mm -hmm. it's a personal thing it's about talking to people directly without the technology but the other thing they show us in this episode is that at one point like some of the wording that the alien gives is a little weird and like the you know the girl at the computer just says that's what the translator's putting it through as, so we have to go with it. So maybe it does stand to ha have someone who can break it down and maybe get the nuances that an automated system, as good mm -hmm. as it might be, will never completely be fully flexible. And, it, you know, so it kind of gives you a couple of examples in this episode as to, okay, 
this is why someone is still studying this to such an extent there has to be people who understand it and yeah she actually um there's a lot of parallels with her character in this and um Hoshi Sato from Enterprise, who is also just a master of languages, is easy to she's just easy to um, pick up the different nuances of, of different dialects and stuff like that. And she's um, she's a good character, but in the beginning, she's not sure why she's in Starfleet. She's sort of pressured into joining because of her skill and not because she actually wants to do it. And even that I found, there's a lot of parallels to Uhura's backstory. Yeah, of course, it's not that she's pressured into it. It's more that she just didn't know what she wanted to do. She, she couldn't go to the uh, the university she was supposed to go to because that's where her parents both worked, and she just didn't feel comfortable there. So she explains that she kind of just didn't feel at home anywhere and ended up going to Starfleet as a result and doesn't really know if this is where she... You know, this is what the, the questioning gets to, is she's very honest with Pike in front of everyone that she's not actually sure if this is her future and Pike's surprised because you know most new cadets are like desperate and they've been dreaming of being in starfleet and they want to like, impress and they want so there's especially this... the enterprise yeah so there's this brutal honesty to it and you know spock's likewise being vulcan when he's walking with her afterwards is very honest and says you know uh if you are not sure that if this is what is for you then maybe you should get leave the spot open for someone else who does dream of this who is in love with the idea of doing this yeah. and because apparently thousands of cadets applied for this position on the yeah. enterprise yeah because they say they only take on a few cadets in the enterprise it's otherwise a fully experienced crew for yeah fairly, fairly obvious reasons i suppose given the type of ship it is but i think this little arc in the episode this idea of because it's not like at the end of the episode she's decided oh this is my future now because that would be too much that would be too much to do in one episode but Having this arc in the episode where Spock accepts that, you know what, it's good that she is here and she's good at what she does and it's, she's, a, she's a value to Starfleet um, Yeah, is a really nice little arc for the episode. And it's the sort of thing where if she's not made that choice yet, I think she's realized and sort of felt what her value is in this role because of what mm-hmm. she does throughout the, the course of the main story in the episode. Well, I think a lot of people react in a, in a way where... Um, because they didn't expect her to say that she's not sure about Starfleet or like if she belongs here, that people, I think a, a lot of the crewmen, not not so much the seniors, but the ones that we see who are maybe on her around her level, like the ensigns and lieutenants and such, are a little, uh, they, they kind of have this attitude like, oh, it, it, are what we do isn't good enough. Like for you, you're, you're too high and mighty or whatever. Um, and I think they, you can kind of see that throughout the rest of the episode where people um, talk down to her um, and it doesn't seem to be a hazing thing anymore. It seems to be like she may have lost some respect, but then is able to gain him back by the end of the episode. Yeah. And I think she does feel more valued and like she can't, ha- you know, she was literally the only person for the job in this situation and saved everybody. So, and, you know, gives her PowerPoint presentation at the end and it turns out like, she was literally the only person who could have done this, so she is where she needs to be. Yeah, although Lan might still hate her guts, but well, I mean, I'm sure that's a relationship they can play with as the season goes on. Uh, <laughs> Lan's got a lot of. I don't know if she hates her or if she's just like, well, I don't have time for you anymore. Then um, don't get in my way, kind of a thing. <laughs> she's she's pretty. Uh, you know, we we know her backstory from the last episode, and we could see that she's. Uh, She's she's a tough broad. She's 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 no nonsense. She's she's very <laughs> yeah. much no nonsense. Like she she looks annoyed at one point when Spock and her are basically just this, she cracks a little joke about Nurse Chapel because they're keeping this idea that Nurse Chapel's got the hots for Spock. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, that's a nice thing to see here. I, I I think what's impressing me actually so far about this is it's not so much that I necessarily think Peck is a great Spock, but I feel like how Spock's been used so far outside of his marriage proposal that I've seen from episode one. Outside of that, I've enjoyed all of his scenes that he's been in since then. And mm-hmm. I think it's because they're playing... And also, I love that he's still got his... Uh, it's, it's, it's like a telescope thing he looks into yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the desk. He's still got yeah. that. I, I appreciate that. It's, does it have the blue light? I haven't checked yet. Oh, I don't know if I had the blue light, but it has that. <laughs> and I noticed the communications girl who's there, who's not a hero, did have the little... Uh, beehive the looking thing. Yeah, <laughs> communicator. Uh, all good stuff. 
so no the, the char- all, all this little character stuff is good and i think it's it's using stuff that connects back to the original series and expands on it and i think the part of the fun of this because even pike himself is that we get to expand on characters who are relatively un- unexplored and then the show and nurse chapel is another one where you know, obviously Ahura was a main cast member and we got to see a lot more of, her, of Nurse Chapel, but I would argue that in terms of characterization, they were pretty level as far as, like, how much story they got. So, that's another thing that should be exciting to see as time goes on. I, I don't know if Nurse Chapel will get devoted episodes. She might be another tier down the character list, but... I don't... I mean, I don't think so. I think she might be about the same as all the other ones. We've got, like, the main... I, I suppose the main two, which is... Uh, the captain and and his first officer, and then I think the rest are probably all equal. Oh, and Spock, so that uh, would probably be three. I actually don't think number one's as high as Spock and Pike. Uh, she feels like she's the one that he talks to, and maybe and I'm sure we'll get some plots with her later that will make her feel more important. But it's, I think maybe it's because she was missing for a lot of that Discovery season, and even the first episode they didn't get to her till later on. But she's felt kind of like. Uh, you in rank, she's the next most important person, but I don't feel like she's been the most important char- character in the show yet. If that makes sense. Yeah, I I have a feeling that they're gonna have um, nothing romantic, but like a, a much more of scenes with them together. I mean, we got quite a bit of that in this episode, even. You know, after each meeting, she would yeah, have yeah. A, a moment with Pike. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so I think these little character things that are connecting back are are being used well where it doesn't just feel like cheap references, which is a danger, especially when you've got some sort of prequel that you're dealing with, Uh, Mm -hmm. because I am very sensitive to prequel bullshit, and I wasn't feeling that from these details. This felt like to me, okay, this is a launching point to actually do something with these characters and just sort of and especially right at the start because it, it kind of feels like okay there's there's room to add new things to Ahura there's room to add new things to uh, Nurse Chapel or whoever but yeah we can start off with Nurse Chapel flirting with Spock a little bit and Spock being oblivious to it because that's mm-hmm. that's you know that's, that's that's the basis and we can build from there uh, and because yeah, I- and because of what they do with Ahura in this episode and specifically given her that dilemma of I don't know if I want to stay in Starfleet I think it's like it's already proving to me that they're going to add enough new things and expand on them that I'm not worried about it being the the focus is the the stuff from the original series. Well, I think it's interesting to get a backstory for her where she wasn't sure if Starfleet was right for her. Of course, we know how it goes, so but there's never really any danger of her leaving Starfleet, you know, because she's in the original series and in all the films. So I. I suspect it's not going to be too much after this episode where she is confused of whether or not she's staying in Starfleet. It's mostly, I think it's going to be mostly the arc of this episode, which I enjoyed. Like, I enjoyed that little background of she just was unsure at first. Oh, yeah. I I think it'll be referenced again. I think there'll maybe be a point, probably towards the end of the season, where she makes a sort of definitive moment where she's presented with a choice or something. But yeah, I don't think it's going to come up every episode. I think this is... It's the plot of this episode, and then it can mm-hmm. be referenced in shorthand later because they've set it up and they can do it quickly later. Uh, I think that's the the, the key thing here. Uh, but like I say, though, we, we're getting to know uh, Artigas more. Uh, we're getting to know... Yeah, I liked her in this. Uh, but the other character we get to know is the other new person there. Was it Hammer? Hammer? Hammer. Hammer. He, so, he's an Anar. He's an Anar, yes. I'm glad you remembered that because I wouldn't have. Uh, so yeah. he's obviously an alien. We saw him beam aboard the ship last episode. And much like uh, Ortega's right before when they're on their way to the uh, to Pike's uh, quarters, they come in and uh, Hammer's, you know, helping prepare the food. He's like chopping some food up. And Ahura offers help and he gets a little offended. And like uh, Spock makes it clear, oh, you've just offended him for, you know, it's, oh sorry that uh, you know i was raised to offer help blah, blah. and th- it becomes cool that he's blind and but he's like he's kind of a blind badass in a lot of ways <laughs> like they they make it very clear <laughs> yeah. quite quickly that he has other senses that are very very good so he's, he's a little daredevil i suppose to p- put it into a quick <laughs> sense yeah uh but he's also he senses things telepathically as well because spock is like communicates telepathically that he's going to throw something and he catches the carrot i think it is over his shoulder yeah yeah, yeah. uh i i kind of liked his his uh attitude though he was giving me kind of like uh 
he's also pretty no nonsense, but he's no nonsense in a way that's very different from uh, La Anne, where yeah. he feels like he's going to be. I don't like quite say he's going to be. The he's dra- more of like a. I'd say maybe he's closer to Worf, no, no nonsense, where there yeah. is still like cheeky remarks. Yeah, there's a bit of humor there. I, I was going to say he's, he's not quite, but like he's 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 got a little Drax in him, just a yeah. little bit of Drax. Okay, yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's no nonsense, but it's like this is going to cause me more work. So thank you. <laughs> Maybe it's just some sarcasm or something. But he's got emotion. Like he's got a nice little smirk, and he likes Uhura because she does speak to him in his native language. Gives him some sass back. Yeah, which is nice. it's a nice moment as well because yeah, like sh- she's kind of like immediately she feels like she's said something wrong, and she's trying to sort of claw back. And then when she realizes that he's having a bit of fun at her expense, she whips out the, the native language and it, he's like, oh shit, okay, I can't actually say too much now because you've actually impressed me. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it gives us a little bit of both of them. Again, it's kind of like how in the last episode, uh, the Ahura Chapel scene gave us a lot for both of those characters in terms of right. their personality. Yeah, yeah, it's actually very similar. This episode does the same thing with a couple of pairings early on, and it's like, oh, that's cool. So in the same way that last episode had one quick Ahura thing with personality, and then we get a full like Ahura-focused episode, this is going to benefit in the same way in a couple of episodes time when we get Hemmer's focused episode or we get uh, Ortega's. I, I wasn't <laughs> expecting one from Ortega's, but she got enough lines this episode that maybe she will. I don't know. Yeah. But. Mm-hmm. It, what's interesting about this series is like everybody has a very distinct haircut. <laughs> it's it's an interesting choice is all like the haircuts I are very was... severe. <laughs> I was not I expecting t- this point. I have to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> oh, and also, I, I do like that the dress uniforms kind of look like the next generation uniforms. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, 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 it's really funny because on, on the one hand, it's like, okay, we're sticking by and large to the simple designs of the original series. Slightly modernized, you know, slightly smarter yeah. looking, but the, the same basic thing. Uh, in the same vein that the ship is based on the Enterprise, but obviously it's way more high tech. So, cool. But we also want to show off the fancy newer designs as well. So we're going to come up with a bunch of reasons why they have alternatives for any yeah. given reason, any given day. Uh, the cynical part of me is like, this is more shit we can sell on Star Trek shop.com. I guess. I mean, there are so many uniforms between like Discovery and Picard and now this show. Like, even the uniforms between Discovery season two when we meet these characters and now are different. Um, it's just. I mean, Discovery, like, every final episode of Discovery has had a new uniform that seems to be teasing what's going to be in the next one, and then in the next uh, season opener, they have different uniforms <laughs> from that one still, so. Yeah, but that's just, right. The costume designer is really being pushed hard. That's right. The season three finale of Discovery showed what was supposed to be the new uniforms, but then... Yeah, every- had, like, the grey with, like, the stripes. The, the, but the backlash online propelled them to change it for season four, so... I guess. I, Who cares about uniforms? <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, they changed all the time in the the nineties as well, and it was just like I assume because the, I assume those mostly came out of like cast complaints. Like eventually, when they got enough money, they're like, "You need to upgrade these polyester, you know, BS things we have to wear every week." Well, that was only one change though. That was after season two, a next gen. Well, it happens in all the series. What did they all start? Did they all revert back to the the onesies? Uh, they changed up the uniforms in in uh, DS Nine a couple of times, and I think Voyager, but I don't really remember. Yeah, but it's not the same thing again, though. It's not they don't start with the, those annoying onesies that clearly were raiding up places that Patrick Stewart demanded to be gone, or he's not coming back. Um, <laughs> I don't think they were onesies, but I think they were still the ones that Patrick Stewart was like. You know, pulling down on all the time. I oh, know Patrick Stewart only did that after season two because his character he'd already established his character has that tick. But the the reason why he did it in season one and two is because he actually had to <laughs> because yeah. it was it was raiding up places. Uh, where uh, I'm sure I, I read an interview where he said that after that he just kept doing it even though they changed it to like a top because it was consistent. Yeah, was, you know, fixing his composure yeah. almost. Yeah. Yeah, but that's all right. Yeah, but then he eventually got that really nice jacket that he has after. I think it's like season four. Yeah, he gets the jacket. It, 
Yeah, the jacket's kind of like the green uniform that Kirk used to wear. Yeah. It, ah. it kind of feels special when it shows up, you know? Like, I don't know why it's here, but I like it. I just, I know, I disagree with that comparison. I, I hated Kirk's green top. I, I was oh, always the wrap? A, I loved that I, I was always annoyed when he wasn't That's wearing like the yellow one. That's like my favorite uniform. Oh, no. It looks like he's, it looks, it looks too casual. It doesn't look like he's wearing Yeah, it's just casual. It's uh, every episode that that happens, it's Friday. <laughs> you're working, <laughs> Kirk. Look like you're working. All right? Come on. You're letting the it team down. It still has the insignia on it. It's fine. <laughs> He's the captain. You started this off by complaining that Pike was too casual and not captain enough, and now you'd be like, oh, he's captain. Oh. He's casual. He's casual with his attitude and with the, his mannerisms, and he's trying to be quippy like he's Iron Man or something. I don't like it. I'm not into it. Just, I... Uh, maybe I'll get it. I'll just... It's a new type of captain. I just have to get used to it, I suppose. It never, it never worked for me with Archer. I like he's, Pike. He's my least favorite captain. I'm just going to say, I like Pike. I, I don't, this is... You, you and like everybody else, I know I'm like alone in this, but he's, he's giving me too many Archer vibes. And you know, I love Enterprise, and I know it's a show, and I love Scott Bakula, but like, I don't like Captain Archer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, plot of the episode, which we should talk about. Uh, is there is this planet, uh, that, and there's a comet going towards that planet. Uh, we see some aliens on the surface, or you know, they're very primitive. They've got tents, and you know, they they got like sort of tribal looking kind of outfits on. Uh, sort of, uh, I, I was watching this in 4K, and the faces were very very detailed in 4K, like all the little. It was like yeah, it was good makeup. It was like it was cracks. Good design. Yeah, it was like sort of. I always say cracks in the skin necessarily, but it was yeah, there was like a a texture to it that looked really good. Anyway, uh, so this comet's coming down, and the the Enterprise picks this up, and I was like, hey, the the, the beings that are on that planet, like, not only do they not have warp technology, they, they you know they, they don't even have electricity yet. Like they do not know that they're about to be decimated by a comet. Like we have to do something. So, as expected, they they swoop in, and they're like, okay, how do we move it? And they're going to, like, put some uh, little ion thrusters onto it, so they fire them off uh, as if they're weapons. But then the, the stinger before the opening titles is that, wait a minute, it's got a shield. Why does it have a shield? <laughs> that's not, that's, that's a comet. Uh, and it turns out there's a structure on the comet, and there's some mystery here as to what's going on. And uh, we get an away team made up of Ahura, and it's her first away mission. They point that out a few times, so it's kind of a big deal for her. Uh, and she goes with Lahan, she, she goes with uh, Spock, and uh, Red Shirt Kirk, Kirk, is what I'm calling him now. <laughs> Not that he's wearing a red shirt, but the fact that he went on this mission as the fourth character, and got knocked out almost instantly, and then spent the rest of the episode unconscious, is making me think that the joke of this is that the guy named Kirk is actually the one who's always going to get like jobbed out to make things you look serious. You think he's going to be like a like Kenny in South Park, where every yes. episode he just dies. <laughs> I, I think he did die in this. I think he's going. He, oh, they technically, yeah, because that did restart his heart. You're right. Yeah, he, he technically died. Yeah, uh, but I, I would say that he's going to be the goof. Well, not a goofball. I don't know if that's the right word, but he's going to be the the one who is there to like show the danger. If someone's going to get impaled, if someone's getting an arm cut off. <laughs> It's going to be Kirk. I think I think it's great that it's him, though, because, like, that is a Kirk thing to, like, leap before looking and just have faith that he's not going to die in, in a way. You but know? he's not the main character, so this time he's actually he's not, not safe. He's not the main character, and I like that, you know, his older brother, like, he probably learned it from being around his older brother, but, like, is better at it than him. I like that a lot. That is pretty funny. So I, I hope mm -hmm. they keep this up. I hope he always feels like a jobber. I really do. I hope that's, like, a consistent thing. <laughs> He's Welshy. Welshy. That's a Futurama reference. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know what the, uh, if there's a comparison to another Trek show. Because obviously the red shows just die, typically. So. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think anyone's died on the Enterprise yet. 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 Yes. Well, we haven't had any. The plots so far haven't had villains that are... Well, there's technically, they, they do try to kill them in the ship, technically, this episode. But you know what I mean? Like, we've not had any, like, phaser fights or anything on a planet's surface, mm -hmm. so there's been no situations yet where a red yeah, shirt might no one's die. No had to die in order to prove how, you know, sticky the situation is. Yes. And no one proved it was stickier than Tasha Yar, because that was a puddle, and it was a very sticky-looking puddle. <laughs> a puddle of evil. <laughs> and evil's 
sticky. Like, you know when you, like, spill, it like, It has uh, a name. His name is Armis. I don't care. So, you know when you spill, like, uh, like, soda or booze or something on yourself and you, you feel all sticky? That's what that puddle makes you feel. It's all sticky. <laughs> no, but I used to work in a movie theater, so I know what sticky soda floors feel like. But... <laughs> You've never spilled a drink on your hand or something? Never. Bullshit. I'm a lady. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, so they go over and they find this central chamber. Uh, Kirk tries to touch... The, he's basically... He pulls a Prometheus. He tries to touch the thing. You're supposed to be a scientist, man. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Spock's standing there going, this is very illogical. I hate uh, uh-huh. that's Kirk. I hope I have to never have to deal with someone named Kirk ever again. Uh- <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the first episode when Kirk is introduced, Pike says, looks over at Spock and says, uh, "He's your new boss." And then Spock looks over at Sam, like, uh, "You're going to be working under me." And he kind of has this like hesitation when he looks over at him, like he doesn't quite trust him. And I suppose this episode confirms why. <laughs> He thinks anyone named Kirk is going to be irresponsible and Phil Hardy. That's what he yeah. thinks. Yeah, I'm, so I'm fra- this is establishing what he feels about Kirk before. I'm just, I'm, Kirk. I'm just phrasing it like this because it's funny to say that he's got this like vendetta in his head because of because Kirk's brother gave him such a bad impression that that James Kirk really had to win him over. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I love that. I think that's great. Yeah, and I do like Ethan Peck. Like, I don't, I don't really like him too much as Bach in Discovery. I tolerated it. I never liked the beard. Um, I'm glad the beard is gone. I do like that he has sort of the, the like, Starfleet sideburns, but they're all squiggly, so it looks alien. Mm-hmm. But it's more flattering to his uh, very strong, like, facial features. Um, but he is very Vulcan in this, like, traditional Vulcan. And it is nice having a Vulcan on the ship. Sure, yeah. No, I mean, Even I, if he's not quite Spock, like, he's a good Vulcan. I've enjoyed his presence on the ship. Maybe that's a good way to put it. Is like, I'll never really feel like he's really Spock, but I do feel like he's a Vulcan. And that's mm-hmm. perhaps more important. Uh, so the big thing here is that uh, all this does like you know there's like symbols on the this like egg shaped thing in the middle of the this room, and Uhura figures out that it's actually music because one she starts singing at one point and the place reacts to her singing, and then she realizes oh this is just math and it's just representing notes uh, because at one point uh, Lan who doesn't really know music very well uh is like no like music is basically just math so much like math even different beings who can't communicate with traditional language could communicate in music to an extent because it is ultimately just numbers like frequencies and stuff like you can translate it. it's universal to a degree so uh she you know that, that's kind of thing it's, it's, it's a little bit close encounters actually they communicate with music uh mm-hmm. so that's kind of fun uh, the other big part of this episode, though, is that a ship shows up as the Enterprise is trying to like get to the the comet, trying to help the away team. This giant ass ship shows up, and this alien says, "No, we shepherd this comet. It's got a purpose, and it'll move and avoid the planet if it chooses to." Uh, and Pike outright doesn't to his face, but calls him a zealot. Right, the idea that okay, these are really just not jobs who believe in this thing. And they see it as this important thing. But we have to save people on the planet. We have to save our away team. And that's our core conflict of the of the episode, uh, is that mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, yeah, and Pretty good stuff. Yeah, the ship's much bigger, so the Enterprise is actually at risk. So there's a... And I like that it gave us kind of a nice little action sequence when Pike says... He basically says, okay, put us on the other side of the, uh, the comets. So, and the plan is we find out later... Uh, other than to distract them so that uh, Spock can do a little fancy thing with uh, the shuttle to like get make the comet move, is that he threatens that the Enterprise will blow up so much that it will destroy the comet if they hit him, so he has to get on the other side of it. So it gives Ortigas, who's meant to be this good pilot, a, a sort of opportunity to show her skills, and we get this kind of them dodging some rock and, you know, lasers as they're going around the other side. It was, this is the sort of moment where I'm like, you know what, this episode feels like a classic Star Trek episode. It doesn't feel like it's betraying what Star Trek's supposed to feel like, but they still mm-hmm. found a natural way to put in a pretty impressive-looking little action sequence that felt like, oh, all they're doing, they're not firing on anyone. I mean, they do fire on their weapons at one point, but other than that, like, it's like, no, no, we're trying to do this without getting into a fight. <laughs> we're trying to do this yeah. just to solve the problem. Which I like. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was very, uh, very discovery in the action in this, but um, but, but it, it was nice. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> it's um, yeah, uh, I enjoyed the action in this as well. Although it wasn't my favorite part, I, I did kind of zone out a bit. Because uh, you can. <laughs> I mean, I had fun with it. I had fun with um, again, just a little bit of that character stuff where. Because it's not just that Ortega says she's the best damn pilot in the galaxy, uh, and Pike sort of acknowledges it. Pike says, "You know, I heard you used to say back at Starfleet Academy that you'd be the best pilot in Starfleet," and she just kind of gives this look like she's like he's not supposed to know that, right? He's not supposed to know that she used to brag like that. So yeah, it's kind of like boasting, and it got around. Yeah, it's just like shit. I'm going to have to like. <laughs> I'm gonna have to be fancy here. I'm gonna have to prove my. Uh... But she's got like these programs already, you know, in the computer. So she says, uh, "Do like Ortega's maneuver one or something." And the computer already has it saved, <laughs> which is kind of kind of fun. That makes some sense. That they did have yeah. like little maneuvers that they they want to try. Yeah. Well, um, I imagine like it's something you'd want to go over with the captain first. But in this situation, it's uh, I'm just going to pull out the big guns. No time for approval. Yeah, um, so I mean, those are the two things of the episode. Obviously, Ahura, by solving the music thing, gets the 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 teleportation blocker to come down so that they can beam them aboard the Enterprise, and from there they they solve the problem. The big thing, though, is that Ahura further studies what she saw in there and presents them at the end with this little interesting kind of what do you call it? Kind of that like, ambiguous thing. Like, well, no, 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 no. What I mean is, like, at the end of like the story, where you just add on that little bit that says, "Hey, maybe there's something more to this that wasn't just, you know, maybe, maybe the religious uh, zealots." No, it's it's um, an epilogue. I mean, more specifically than that, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> maybe the religious zealots are actually maybe maybe it's true. Maybe, maybe what they said was true. Like, maybe this thing actually did have a purpose, and like, is well, first of all, is a knock-on effect where some of the the the, the the water, well, not the water, but the the stuff that comes out of the comet when part of it breaks off, when Spock's redirecting it. Yeah, I think they said it was water. Yeah, it, it, it basically changes the atmosphere of the planet a little bit. Not too much, but enough that it actually makes the planet more suitable for planet growth and things like that. So it's actually going to make life flourish, which was one of the things the Zealots said it was going to do, is it, it, it can either bring life or take it away. And this is literally bringing life, which inherently mm -hmm. will also mean this, the intelligent beings will also thrive and you know, advance uh, beyond what they currently are. So it's like, okay, so it's done that. And then also the flight, the the, the, the trajectory of it and the, the messaging inside this comet also implies it knew where it was going and the trajectory it's on now that it's moved is actually what it said it was going to go afterwards. So mm -hmm. it, it gets this thing. It was like, is it predetermined? You know, did it account for the fact that Spock and the Enterprise would intervene kind of thing? And... I don't want an answer to this. I'm glad it doesn't try to answer. It's just a little bit of, huh, there's more to this than just, it was random, you know, it was just a, a coincidence that the comet was going to go into it and now this has happened. Yeah. And the aliens call back like, we told you, this was all part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I, I think I liked it because it, it plays into the themes. You know, one of the things that we've not talked about yet is Pike talking about you know this continued thing where he's talking about his eventual death and what he knows it's coming and number one's kind of like noticing it and asking him about it and pulls out a terminator line yeah there is no fate <laughs> but what you make yeah she, i mean it's not exactly that but it's very close it's very close <laughs> uh, and it's this idea that like, this idea of fate and destiny and him thinking about it uh, and we find out that he's actually looked up the the, the, the people he's going to save by what he does um and it's interesting that because they're all children, and I think he still referred to them as kids when he saves them, means that there's kind of like a, a tighter time on this than we maybe thought. Like, that, I mean, maybe, maybe they're all teenagers by the time this happens to yeah, them. Yeah, they're but... all cadets. They, they look like they're around 10 years old or something yeah. in, the, in the photos. So so it gives us like a more specific timeline than I thought like we'd get. So mm -hmm. uh, it's very curious. What, what's interesting about this is that I, I can't see them like bringing this up constantly. Let's this, this say this show runs for five seasons, right? Because it says mm -hmm. a five-year plan, you know, in the, the intro. Um, let's say it goes five seasons. 
I can see it. That's been something that's brought up every episode for five seasons. I feel like there has to be something that kind of ends it in season one as a story arc, and then if they want to bring it back up towards the end of the show when we may actually get to it happening, then you know you bring it back up then. But I, I can't see it being something that's a constant at the forefront for the whole show. I understand the temptation to, um, you know, not have your main character that people except me love get into this horrible accident and uh but i, I actually really like the the arc in, in discovery with with pike where he does accept it and has a happy ending with uh with with vima vina at the end i think that's her name um where she goes he goes to talus four and he's able to be with a woman that he loves forever so i think that's that's already like his happy ending but i don't know if it's I don't know if the if the showrunners are trying to like or if the the writers are trying to say well maybe maybe not maybe he'll be able to change what's going to happen and so you don't have to have your your main character of this show have this horrible end i think it's a possibility it would be foolish if they didn't bring it up and bring it up and you know address the idea that this even if they weren't going to play it as heavily as they are it would be actually stupid if they just never like brought up the fact that he kind of knows that he's going to meet this I think end. it's good that he has this this trauma and I think it's inspiring that he's choosing to do go through all this still you know and it, it obviously it's a very heavy weight and every time something reminds him of it yeah he kind of gets stopped in his tracks I think that's all good but like I really like the 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 arc that he has in Discovery where he like he still chooses to have this end of his life or at least you know his life as he knows it um, for the greater good and still gets to go off and be with the girl at the end. Yeah, but there's a, there's a lot more to explore with it, though, and I'm pretty sure when they wrote that, they didn't know he was getting his own show. So, no, definitely not. So they, you know, they, they only gave it whatever time they did and however much focus it got. And now, oh, now that we actually get to spend seasons with him, this is definitely something they should look into more. And I think they should, because it is like a really interesting idea that the main character of your show knows roughly that he's going to die at a certain point that is far too interesting to explore to put aside sure. because technically discovery ticked a box at the end of the season you know right yeah well yeah i mean i suppose the same thing kind of happens to sam kirk where like we know that he dies <laughs> in yes. a really useless way Which, the... <laughs> Joe, funny though. so if we end up like liking this character a lot it might be kind of you know, difficult. Joe, it's funny though, I do appreciate that they've got effectively two characters who we both know meet at a, a tragic end, but they're actually, they're, they're doing a good job of, like, we're joking about Sam Kirk. It's funny that he's, like, got this <laughs> well, ending coming. even his death in the original series is kind of like a like a Tasha Yar m- move. <laughs> oh, sure. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, though, is that they're doing a good job of, like, not making me feel that they're doing two of the same thing. Or, or mm-hmm. not that he knows he's going to die. We it's just us that know he's going to die. But th- just this idea that it could be very easily like feel like a lot of crossovers happening, and I don't feel it is because one of them's just like a joke character effect. I mean, he's not like a complete so buffoon. Far. I mean, we don't yeah. really know, but he has a mustache, so we can assume. Yes, which by the way, I, I love uh, Pike saying something about he says like you know, it's like, it's, 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 like it's growing on or yeah, something. He yeah, he says something about the mustache that gave me a chuckle. Uh, I appreciate love that. the mustache. <laughs> yeah Glad I, it's coming back yeah um yeah th- yeah, yeah no i i d- like that pike's dealing with this um i am open to there being some kind of change to it uh either way though it has to be something that has to have kind of an ending this season now that's not to say that it'll be averted maybe you'll think it's averted or whatever but uh, either way I, we can't really talk about ultimately what this is going to mean to the show until the show's finished because we don't know how like because this, this is the thing like no matter what they do if they end this show with him getting into this predicament and going through that story that leads to the original series then i'll be impressed it takes some balls to go through with that and not change anything uh but alternatively we are doing like you know it's a new show it's we can we can alter it timeline it if we want whatever like at this point i i i'm more interested (laughs) i am far more interested in this feeling like star trek than lining up with the other shows yeah i don't know 
I don't know if I can forgive them if they <laughs> save Pike. I don't well, know. We'll see. I mean, it's still early. I I think I would be upset if he doesn't end up in the chair with the beeps. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's not to say that we don't have to. We even have to see it. Like, it could literally just end the show with like before that happens. Like a bittersweet thing. Yeah. Like maybe he's, he's going to go have. I mean, a... that's what that's what season two was too. Like the the bittersweet moment for Pike. Well, yeah, but again, like we we can't take the fact that <laughs> Discovery just sort of quickly wrapped up his story. Because they didn't think we were going to see him again. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we have to explore these things. We we have to. It'd be, it'd be silly not to. But I agree. I don't think they're going to. I don't think every episode he's going to look in the mirror and see like his melting face or anything like that each time. There's been there's been a heavy like you know subplot with it in two episodes so far. I think it's going it to be. It makes sense that it would be a big part of season one. I I think it's going to be a recurring thing most episodes this season. And there'll be some kind of closure to it for now. Not not something that definitively like puts a cap on it forever, but there'll be something that says we don't have to talk about this for a while again. Like, you know, at the end of the season. <laughs> Maybe he gets like selective amnesia. <gasps> Maybe Spock can mind meld it out of him. The knowledge of his death. If he asks Spock to do that, I'll. I, I, that's interesting to me. If he does it without him knowing, I'm less interested. Oh, I would imagine he would ask him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so we'll see which which could be interesting because then you have number one carrying this burden of knowing i mean spock would too but number one i think it'd affect number one more <laughs> yeah but it makes sense that spock would know because spock is the one that arranges the talus for meetup oh no oh, sure i'm not saying it, but i'm just meaning that f- from seeing the characters play out on the show number one clearly is worried about him just now wants to convince him that he can change things and if pike then doesn't know if he gets his mind wiped of it then she's going to like she's going to be the one feeling the awkwardness and like sensing danger mm-hmm. and worried about him and all these things, you know. She'll have that like mother's fear of her of her baby boy like every time he goes out <laughs> on a mission, like it's today the day. My boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though that I know they're like, the same age, probably give or take. But <laughs> I mean, I, I, the point is just the the feeling that the mm-hmm. one has. Um. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of potential there. And I, I think so far they've been, they're, they're doing some interest. I, I do love the idea of him, like, looking at the people that he knows he's going to save. And, like, this is what my life is going to be worth. It's the life of these five people. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I like that, too. So. And he has cool. all the names memorized. And he's, you know, he's taking some action at the end of the episode to, like, to learn more about them. And, I don't know, maybe... To get enough information to be able to stop things from happening, who knows? Who knows where he's going with it? I can't. Yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't say again. I wouldn't say I like this episode more than episode one. Probably a little less. Episode but, one was pretty strong. Yeah. But I think I just appreciated that this never annoyed me. I liked the characters pretty much the entire time, including yeah, totally. Pike. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I appreciated all the little character beats and the little jokes with each other. And I think what's good as well is that it is actually coming off as endearing. Because th- let's be honest here, sometimes when scripts try to make the characters witty and endearing by having funny little quippy lines, it can be annoying. Like, Ortega's, I, I think, was was nice enough in this episode and, like, I think amusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's, she's got the charisma, seemingly, to, like, deliver these lines. But it can very, cool. it can very mm-hmm. quickly turn into, like, you know, you know, remember in, like, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, like, every time it cut back to, like... and. I, Bradley Whitford's a great actor, but every time it cut back to him, Eddie would be like, that lizard oh is just... Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could very quickly turn into that, so... Uh, no. But it, you know, it was funny, because like, they talk about how, oh, let's hope the aliens don't know about the away team, because they've already threatened us. They probably wouldn't take too kindly to that knowledge. And then, you know, something happens where it's clear that they know there's an away team down there. And, like, Ortega's, you know, has some, like, I think it's safe to say they know about the away team. Looks like they know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, I like her character. I Honestly, like, I like all these characters. Pike is just the only one that I'm, you know, iffy on. <laughs> I'm working on it. Like, he's clearly very charming and very <laughs> handsome. And he's got a great haircut. But, like, I don't know, man. Like... Just be more, just be a little bit more commanding. That would be nice. And I think specifically with this episode, it's nice that because I, I came out of episode one saying that I like to tell the characters pretty much. It's nice mm-hmm. that this episode, the two new characters, uh, which were briefly introduced at the end of the last one, but Great. Sam mm-hmm. Kirk 
I now love the idea of him being injured every episode. That's hilarious to me. And yes, uh, I Hammer, to Kenny. <laughs> and Hammer, I think uh, so far I like, and I thought he was entertaining and had chemistry with Uhura. So yeah, Uhura yeah. with with Spock, he had a good rapport with Spock too. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Really yeah, good. Yeah, it's funny because he's kind of got like this harsh. Uh, because obviously Spock, with the, with the the lack of the emotion, is very matter of fact. Whereas mm-hmm. Hammer is a little bit more antagonistically ma- matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's very good. So yeah, there's there's a bit of a, a because vibe Spock them. has a uh, devoid of all emotion. Everything kind of comes off as harsh. Yes, you don't really know how to how to read it. But but that's always been a Vulcan thing. That's been part of their charm. Whereas Hammer's just kind of harsh. <laughs> <laughs> But you know there's loving in there. Like, there's there's something in that... There's a warmth to it. A harsh warmth. It seems like it. It seems like it. Uh, <laughs> That's so. a, a species that was also introduced in Star, in Enterprise. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see. Also, I love the uh, Children of the Comet because obviously the t- title refers to the yes, idea of a cult. Of corn. <laughs> what? I was thinking Children of the Corn. <laughs> no, I was like, It's saying- hard to read, like... Children of the Comet and not want to add like a part six to it or something. <laughs> I just seems like a, it seems like a perfect horror movie title that should have a franchise straight to straight to DVD. I did not get that at all. What I was going to say is that it makes me think of Children of the Atom, which is, you know, cult like worship of a bomb. Oh, OK. Well, um, to each their own. And that's clearly what it's referencing because it's a zealot like <laughs> cult who worship this comet. But whatever. <laughs> Mm, I think Children of the Corn works a bit better. Just, just believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, good second episode. Still very positive. Way to go, Trek. Things are looking bright. This is. Yeah. I believe sh- it's all the same writers and stuff too. So as the other shows, this must just be their wheelhouse, I guess. Apparently, I mean, maybe it'll shut the bed because any time I've felt promised in the other shows, but even the other shows, though, like right from episode one, something felt a little off. Uh, mm, I disagree. Well, you can disagree, but uh, Discovery's always felt overly flashy for what it is. It's always felt like it's trying too hard. Picard is oof. So can we have like? Can we just have a nice review without like telling all the things we hate about the other shows? And by we, I mean you. No, nah, because this has to include your pike complaints. Well, yeah, because it's part of this show, so it's relevant. <laughs> I would just really like that. Okay, okay. All, right. All right. Thank we'll you. S- we'll see if Tara gets what she wants next episode. Because we'll be back next week with episode three. Look forward to it. Uh, so let us know what you think of this episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds in the comments below. Like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications, all that stuff. Uh, of course, you can check out me and Connor working our way through Star Trek The Next Generation. We already did the original series. There's a huge playlist of both of those things. Uh, you can go check out. Go have a look at that. Uh, me and Tara, of course, are working through Babylon 5 right now as well. We're in season four, so... A lot of good sci-fi TV talk uh, to go and enjoy, uh, as well as our movie podcast, yeah. The Atomic Cinema Experiment, over in Mail Fuzz Movies. Uh, we just did, uh, what just came out? Species. We just did Species. And Classic. Event Horizon is up next. There's a bit of an 80s season going on right now. That's right. So, I look forward to those 90s things. 90s and aliens, how appropriate. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Head over to patreon.com slash TV if you want to support all the content for as little as a dollar per month to get some bonuses for your troubles. But otherwise, that is us. So thank you. Keep watching Star Trek. And I should probably get a specific outro for Modern Trek. You know, something... Because I've, I've got one for next gen that's kind of specific to that. You know. Oddly, it worked for Picard, too. Yeah, I did, well, I the final episode of that, yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, keep watching Star Trek and, you know. Uh, Boldly go? Yeah, explore strange new worlds, uh, seek out new life, civilizations. Boldly go where no one has gone before.